<laughs> okay. okay. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to PetroScience STEM Life. I'm Yeti and I'll be moderating the session today. So wherever you are tuning in from, be it from your home, at the office, or maybe even on the move, thank you very much for joining us today. So for those of you who missed our introductory session last month, PetroScience STEM Life is a monthly digital forum brought to you by PetroScience, the Discovery Center. And for your information, this um, PetroScience STEM Life is actually the avenue where we invite experts in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, to discuss on current issues in the country from the STEM point of view. So we try to make it not only relevant to you, but also, of course, we try to make it as interesting as possible and, of course, beneficial to the public. All right, so in the last session, we talked about COVID-19 and living in the new norm. So we know that the battle against COVID-19 is far from over. And we've seen what the virus can do. In just six months, nearly 8 million people worldwide were infected with over 400,000 deaths. Literally, it put the entire world at a standstill. And of course, needless to say, there are negative after effects, be it socially and economically. But I believe now we are ready to come to terms that life must go on, life must proceed despite the new norm practice. And that actually brings us to today's topic. Is there a possibility of a new virus emerging after this? And when that happens, will we be prepared to fight it? And of course, as community, what can we do when that happens? Well, to help us shed some light and explain further on this topic, please welcome our two guests. Joining us today, virologist Dr. T. Kok Kang, a senior lecturer from the Department of Medical Microbiology, University Malaya. Dr. T currently heads UM's Pathogen Genetics and Evolution, Evolution Laboratory. So Dr. T is also an adjunct associate professor at the School of Healthcare and Medical Sciences, Sunway University. In terms of research, Dr. T's um, interest is focused on genetic and evolutionary characterization of blood-borne and respiratory viruses, and that includes human coronaviruses. Not only that, he has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles, and he is currently the editor for various international journals. Very impressive. Welcome, um, Dr. T, and thank you for joining us for the second edition of PetroScience STEM Life. Welcome, Dr. T. Thank you, Ponyati. How are you doing today? Very good, very good. Great. Okay. So moving on, also joining us for today, we have Associate Professor Dr. Faisal Ali Anwar Ali Han from the Faculty of Resource Science and Technology, University of Malaysia, Sarawak. So Dr. Faisal is a mammologist with a particular interest in bats. Intriguing. We'll get to that after this. So Dr. Faisal is a member of the Young Scientist Network Academy Science of Malaysia, YSNASM, which Dr. T is also a member of. And Dr. Faisal is the steering committee for the Southeast Asian Bat Conservation Research Unit and a member of the International Relations Committee of the American Society of Mammologists. And not only that, his work has been published in various local and international journals and books. Welcome, Dr. Faisal, to the second edition of PetroScience STEM Live. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Looking forward to uh, share some things. Great. So I'm sure by listening to my introduction, we have a sense of how busy both of you usually are. So we would like to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Dr. T and Dr. Faisal. We really, really appreciate it. Okay, so before we move on to the more serious question, I would like to first ask uh, a couple of questions that perhaps each of you could answer from your personal point of view and experience just for us to break the ice. Okay, would that be okay with you? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with Dr. T. So Dr. T, as a virologist, I'm sure you've had numerous um, experiences dealing with viruses. And obviously you would know about viruses 
much better more than the rest of us. So would you perhaps um, give us a bit of a so-called crash course on what is actually a virus? And because we commonly use the word germs, um, are they the same? Are they different? Dr. T? Thank you, Bonyati, for the question. And first of all, thank you, PetroScience, for having me here today. So basically, germs can be divided into at least three types. There are viruses, bacteria, and also parasites. And by definition, virus is a non-living organism, which means it requires uh, a host for energy source. And it also requires uh, uh, the host for replication. So host here refers to human, animals, insects, or even some plants. So in contrast, um, for bacteria, it is actually a single cell living organism that produces its own energy or slash metabolism and reproduce on its own. So to quote Peter Madawa, a famous biologist and a Nobel uh, Prize winner, a virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. Wow, I like that last quote. So basically, just remember everyone, when you say germs, it doesn't mean that it's virus because virus, bacteria, and the other parasites are different. It needs a host to continue on to reproduce. Right, Dr. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so um, moving on to Dr. Faisal, in my introduction just now, we know that you have a particular interest in bats. So we know in the midst of this pandemic, bats are actually being blamed for spreading the virus. So since you are a bat enthusiast, how, how do you feel about this? And is it true? Are bats really to be blamed for this? Oh dear, this is really hurting. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, our host, PetroScience and Young Scientist Network for the opportunity given to share uh, some information uh, in slightly a different point of view uh, as a zoologist. Uh, and thank you to all the listeners. So talking about blames, eh? so uh, I have uh, put up a slide previously and I'll quickly uh, share the slide just to get uh, a starting. So we can see that uh, for the recent pandemic, uh, COVID-19, we see the blame has been always circulating around wildlife. Uh, starting off with bats and then moving into uh, snakes and then going back to bats and then moving to pangolin and then going back again to bats. And if you see, uh, if all these animals can speak the language uh, we understand, so some of these animals might be saying something like this. Uh, if you ask the snake, they probably say that, you know, uh, whatever uh, pandemic that we are seeing right now is nothing to do with them. It should be something to do with mammals. Uh, probably if you ask pangolin, pangolin would say that, you know, I usually avoid meeting anyone. I just roll up at any point. Uh, and if you ask bats, Probably they say that it's okay, you know, we already have a lot of things to be blamed at and we'll just take this one as well. So this is what probably the animal would respond uh, towards that question. Uh, and also, uh, we are also starting to learn about the virus. In March, uh, we start to have some idea about the genome of uh, this particular virus. And we see that uh, this particular virus is about 96.2%, you know? So usually in the exam, if we score 96.2%, it's great. But this is very different in, uh, in a virus perspective in which 96.2% similarity with the virus that is found uh, in, in bats, it means something like uh, comparing between human and chimp. They are completely a very different thing. But we start to learn something. We learn that potentially, potentially, the origin of this virus may have been from bats. This is the only information that we are starting to learn. Um, but it doesn't provide any insight into how bats are spreading and so forth. So rather than focusing on the blame, I think uh, it is quite important for us to look into multiple researchers 
that that are significant to human in which has been going on in country in Malaysia itself where we see that uh, researchers are studying into the critical role played by bats for example uh, in pollination services and if we look at the pollination services one of the key element is durian pollination okay so we always talk about uh, durian kawin in a malay language okay we always forget siapa yang tolong kawinkan uh, that is the key so bats are among the key uh, pollinator that helps the pollination services for durian uh, these also include other plants such as petai banana um, mangoes uh, mangrove trees uh, among others to to cite studies also shown that uh, bats play a critical role in control insect population so they feed on insect and this is the key to control pests so looking into uh, our own work in sarawak so we just look into these very rare bats endemic species in in borneo we found that this particular species can eat uh, from seven different orders so they can really uh, control pest population and they are very generalist and these are very critical otherwise we're going to have so many mosquitoes around and also not forgetting given that some of these bats uh, feed on fruits they disperse seed and this is some of the key element or ecosystem services that bats provide in order to ensure forest regeneration to continue in which otherwise uh, we are not going to get these free services from someone else so uh, the known and scientifically well studied contribution by bats is beyond the blames that we are talking today so that's uh, to talk about blames <laughs> thank bats. you dr faisal interesting pictures thank you for sharing your personal pictures okay. with us and that means be, uh, just because the virus that is um, that we are facing now actually originates from bats doesn't mean bats are to be blamed Thank you, Bats, um, to because kahwin <laughs> kan um, the durians. Thank you for that. Um, because you mentioned that the virus that originates from the bat and the virus that is attacking us now are actually different, right? So talking about different viruses, um, Dr. T, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that caused COVID-19, was actually initially named novel coronavirus. So naming it novel coronavirus meaning that it's something new so what does it mean actually for a virus to be a novel or new coronavirus and how do these new viruses are actually discovered thanks for your tea for the question very tough indeed <laughs> so um when an outbreak of disease that cannot be associated with previously known pathogens uh, whether a, a virus bacteria or parasite then a new pathogen is suspect, suspected to cause the outbreak. So in the case of COVID-19, um, the presence of a new virus was actually first evident in the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market. And this is uh, back in late December, where a cluster of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin were reported to the authority. And at that time, no known pathogens can be isolated from these cases. And this raised the alarm that the outbreak could be caused by a new agent, uh, most likely due to a virus, based on the clinical uh, symptoms. Therefore, uh, sam samples were taken from patients to test for a possible new virus. And these samples included uh, blood, swabs, urine, or even autopsy samples from disease patients. And from these samples, the genetic code of the virus was, in was decrypted. So genetic sequencing is a powerful um, technology for virus identification. Um, it is a sensitive and highly accurate uh, method that can produce high resolution data within a short period of time. I'm showing you a, a picture here of the um, genetic tree of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, virus. 
And from the genetic data, together with bio bioinformatics analysis, it generates high resolution data to define a new virus. So as indicated in this figure, um, the SARS-CoV-2 is clearly different from other uh, related coronaviruses, for example, SARS, the MERS, and others uh, uh, viruses isolated from the bats. So the genome is not only useful to define a new virus, it is also uh, very useful to enable the uh, rapid development of a real-time PCI diagnostic test that we are using today to detect a virus. So in short, to define a new virus, um, the virus that are, uh, that, that, that are being sampled has to be genetically distinct from other previously known viruses. Um, and in addition to outbreaks, um, actually new viruses can also be discovered through active genetic surveillance studies in humans, uh, animals, and also from the environment. So um, as mentioned, new viruses can infect animals or plants too with or without causing any clinical symptoms or disease. And some of these animal viruses do have the potential to spill over to humans, causing disease, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic. Back to you, Ponyan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, so from the um, figures that you have shown just now, and also, um, up to my my um, knowledge, to date, most of the new viruses that are discovered can be traced back to animals. And you also mentioned the possibility of spillover to human population. So, um, yes. Dr. Faisal, since uh -huh. Malaysia, we know Malaysia is actually a biodiversity hotspot. So we've got a battalion of animals here in Malaysia. Are we actually at an increased risk um, of having new virus um, emerging? Sure. Uh, thank you. Again, uh, another great uh, question. And I think talking about biodiversity, I think it's very important for me to share a little bit, you know, what sort of a diversity we are talking about. So if we look at the global, at the global scale, we have a total of uh, more than 6,500 mammal species. I'm talking just about mammals. So uh, we can imagine birds, insects, uh, reptiles, amphibians, they are going to be more than these. Okay? And of these, we can see that at least uh, about 1,400 over uh, species are bats. Okay? So they are, they are huge. You know? So they are the second most uh, diverse in terms of uh, mammalian species after rodents. And, and uh, in, if we look at the Southeast Asia scale, we are talking about having 300 uh, species uh, in which 200 of them are endemic, which can only be found in uh, Southeast Asia. And this represents basically in Southeast Asia alone, we are talking about 25% of the known bat that is found uh, globally. And uh, I think it's also important for me to highlight uh, of these species, 60% uh, of them are considered as least concerned, you know, uh, which means they are considered that they are all doing fine, in which we know that, no, their population are also threatened by a lot of uh, other activities, including uh, human activities. In Malaysia, if we look specifically, we have a total of uh, about 133 bat species, give or take. Uh, which is about half of the species that we know from Southeast Asia. And this is basically from nine different family of bats uh, that uh, we have in, in Malaysia. And uh, for Borneo, we have a total of 100 species uh, of bats that can be found in, in Borneo. They are, so they are just not diverse. Whenever we talk about diversity, we are not only talking about diversity as a species. So, for example, uh, bats, they are also very diverse in terms of the way how they look, their features, the morphology, uh, which enable them to adapt to different diets. This can include uh, insectivorous, uh, nectarivorous, and frugivorous. These are the three highlights for Malaysia. And in other parts of the world, we can also see carnivorous bats that feed on rodents, frogs, uh, Piscivorous bats that feed on fish, all 
or the one that we know more is those that feed on blood, which we call as uh, sanguinivorous. You know, we are much more uh, prone to everything like blood, sharp. These are our, our uh, normal norm for, for human. In fact, for this particular reason, uh, studies have shown that uh, bats and rodents are among the group which harbor most viruses. So we can see that. So if you have more species, you should expect to have more viruses because you are more diverse in terms of number of species. So there's nothing unique about why, why a lot of viruses are found in bats. So the answer to that, the first answer and easy is because the bat group itself, they are very diverse. We are talking about more than 1,400 uh, different species. And yes, uh, a lot of these viruses are found in animal. So to summarize, it's about 75% of uh, all these uh, emerging infectious disease are of zoonotic origin, which is from, from animal. And of course, and of course, again, it is pointing, a lot of them pointing towards bats in general. So uh, a quick summary about all the, the, the different type of uh, virus we are talking about that uh, has been always been uh, associated with bats are those that has been directly either spilled over from bats to human. For example, uh, in the case of Nipah virus in Bangladesh, uh, also in the case of Marburg virus. Uh, so these are some examples in which we see uh, studies show that there is a direct spillover to, to human from bats to human. They are also the, the more popular one that is also include the current virus in which it used the intermediate host. So bats, and then it is passed to another intermediate host before it moves into a human. This indirect movement, which includes our Hendra virus that occur in uh, Australia. Uh, we have uh, Nipah virus that occur in, uh, in Malaysia. SARS-CoV, not forgetting, uh, which has been said to occur from bats and then move into another intermediate host. So the key here is, or the question that always been asked, uh, what makes bat so special that allow them to harbor these viruses? So in the context of uh, bat uh, ecology, a bad immune system, I'm going to talk more on their physiological features that make them very unique uh, in comparison to other uniqueness that we see uh, how bats immune system respond to viruses. We see that one key thing that has been highlighted by scientists, uh, they show that uh, the reason for us to see some of these viruses of concern uh, in bats is probably due to the ability of flight, the ability of bats flying. And why? Why is that? It's because flying require a lot of energy. So it's a high energy metabolic demands for flight that, lead, that can lead to elevated body temperature uh, in bats, which mimics typically whenever you get fever, you will also rise your body temperature to shed these uh, viruses. So these viruses in bats has been adapting to this physiological feature in which they are used to high temperature, in which we see that when this virus move into a different organism, now they can have uh, alarming consequences. So these are the uniqueness of, uh, uh, of bats in which potentially lead to some of the uh, instances that we see in uh, the pandemic uh, today. So having all that said, uh, one thing uh, that we need to keep in mind is that this bad associated spillover is not a simple process as how I just discussed. So it basically have multiple other factors uh, that contribute towards this uh, spillover, which include the first one, which is the most critical one, which we need to pay attention is on the factors that deals with the ecological potential to be in contact with these bats. You know? So the bats typically try 
will try to avoid human. So the first key factor is the potential uh, to be in contact with these bats. The second point is the virus and host uh, molecular as well as cellular compatibility. So whether they are compatible to uptake the viruses in them. And finally, of course, uh, the ability of immune system, are they able to fight them or not? So there are multiple different factors that need to be considered before we are talking about how this virus can enter a particular host. So that uh, a quick summary on uh, the uniqueness and what we see in bats. So back to you, Kwan I see. Okay. So that means, Dr. Faisal, even though Malaysia, in Malaysia, we have um, high diversity of animals and um, a lot of uh, many species of bats and um, a lot of this um, new emerging infectious disease can be traced back to bats. But to um, for a spillover to occur, actually, a lot of other factors comes into play. And you mentioned just now about um, contact with the bats themselves. So bat itself is not the problem. They do not um, on themselves contribute to the spillover of the virus from the, um, the bats to human population. But we must be mindful of um, avoiding direct contact with the bats. Am I correct, Dr. Faisal? Yes. Okay, so um, I, I will continue on asking um, a couple of questions after this, but let me just um, take some time to remind our viewers, if let's say you have any questions um, that you would like to ask either Dr. T or Dr. Faisal regarding um, on our um, topic discussion for today, please put down your questions in the comment section. And um, uh, after I have um, finished asking questions to Dr. Faisal and Dr. T, we will actually select two questions to be answered at the end of these um, live sessions. And please do ask good questions because the selected questions, the um, owner of the selected questions will actually win some merchandise, um, PetroScience and um, Petronas Twin Towers merchandise. And also, please make sure that you stay tuned until the end of the live session because next week and the week after, we will actually post two questions that is related to this live session on our um, Instagram. And the first person to answer each question correctly, of course, will be selected as the winners and will also receive exclusive PetroScience and Petronas Twin Tower merchandise. So please make sure you stay tuned until the end of the live session and also ask questions. All right. So Dr. T, yeah. relating back to um, what Dr. Faisal have said just now, there are many factors that come into play that can result in the spillover of um, the viruses from one um, host population to the other host population, for instance, from bats to humans. Sometimes it even requires an intermediate host. So for a virus to be able to be transmitted from one species to another, a mutation must happen to the virus. Am I correct, Dr. T? Yes, absolutely. Right? So that was the case with SARS-CoV-2. So with that, is there a possibility after COVID-19 pandemic is over, is there a possibility for more mutations to occur that will result to new virus to emerge? And since we have already faced COVID-19, are we now, especially the research and the um, medical field experts, are we now more prepared for it when it happens? Thanks, Ponyati, for the tough question again. <laughs> I, I think um, by now we know that uh, the only constant for a virus is mutation. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes the COVID-19, is a new virus that belongs to the family called coronaviridae that normally circulate in animals and humans. So like any other viruses, SARS-CoV-2 will continue to mutate while circulating in humans. But we have to remember, if you can recall in the last decade, SARS-CoV-2 is not the only threat to us. In the last 10, 15 years, influenza H1N1, if you still remember, that uh, caused a, a huge pandemic worldwide in 2009. Even influenza uh, H7N9, 
caused an outbreak in China. The uh, re-emergence of Ebola in many parts of Africa. And similar to SARS-CoV-2, the, the emergence of MERS-CoV in the Middle East. And now SARS-CoV-2, of course. So in the last 10, 12, 15 years, there are no signs that show that the emergence of new virus or disease is slowing down. And quite interestingly, let me show you a quick uh, content here. Sure. And quite interestingly, um, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, more than 500 species, if I remember correctly, of coronaviruses have already been identified in bats in China more than 500 species prior to COVID-19 outbreak. And many of which do not cause any disease symptoms in their natural hosts, which is the bad. And it has also been speculated that up to a staggering 5,000 previously unknown coronavirus species could be circulating quietly in bats. 5,000 different species in bats circulating quietly. And um, it has been shown that human activities are one of the leading causes of viral emergence. And uh, activities such as extensive farming, uh, livestock production, uh, human urbanization, pollution, etc., cetera, and, and global trade and travel, very importantly. And these activities have led to zoonotic spillover of exotic viruses to humans. So unless these activities are stopped, new virus are very likely to emerge in the future. And to answer your second question, are we more prepared if similar uh, outbreak uh, occurred? So if you were lucky, uh, similar outbreaks uh, uh, like the one that we see in COVID-19 occur in the future, we are probably more prepared, I think, in handling the situation, um, given the experience we have gained from COVID-19 in the past few months. Let's take uh, South Korea, for example. And they had a mers cov outbreak a few years ago uh, in, in Seoul. And as a consequence of that outbreak, they had improved their overall preparedness in handling the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic by having uh, expanded diagnostic capacity, uh, a very swift and, um, and uh, uh, evidence-based public health responses, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, in relative in relative to other countries which have no experience in handling such a crisis, and uh, in in addition to Korea, I think a uh, similar situation in Hong Kong and Taiwan as well, because uh, they had experienced the previous uh, SARS outbreak, SARS CoV one, that happened in uh, early two thousand. So. Most of these uh, emerging infectious diseases that I mentioned, they are actually respiratory related. But we also have to remember that uh, a disease or a new outbreak can exist in different shapes and forms. Um, mo most recently, for example, I think we still remember very well that uh, there was this Zika virus outbreak in, in, in many parts of the world back in 2015. So Eddie's mosquito was involved in, in spreading the, the virus and it causes uh, fever, rashes, joint pain, which are very similar to that of dengue fever. So in, if a pregnant woman is infected, perhaps um, it, it can lead to congenital abnormality as well, such as a microcephaly. So this is an, uh, one form of a disease, a newly emerging disease, which is completely different than what we are experiencing now. Um, another example, um, there's this virus that we hardly heard of. It's called the Huayangshan Banyang virus which is a tick-borne uh, uh, associated, tick-borne virus associated with uh, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, in which these patients will experience fever, low pleated count, and sometimes it involves multiple uh, uh, organ infection as well. And uh, in addition, I think the patients will also experience vomiting, diarrhea. So the disease spectrum can be highly variable for, for all these uh, uh, new diseases caused by new viruses. So therefore, I think it is, uh, are we prepared to handle uh, such an outbreak in the future? I think probably yes, but we have to be uh, very flexible and very agile to respond to different outbreaks um, uh, in the future.
Thank Back you, Dr. Moderator. T. <laughs> Thank you. So I like your point on being agile because I'm sure now in um, the days of technology where information are literally at the tips of our fingers, um, we can now be more prepared as a community to get on um, uh, on our feet with the latest information to be prepared for um, what's going to happen next. So relating um, to what Dr. T said just now, yeah, um, Dr. Faisal, human activities actually play a huge role in the um, emergence, in the transmission of new um, viruses. It's not just um, the animals. So activities um, like uh, livestock production and then um, global travel and trade, it this all increased the contact between human to human and also human to animals. But um, we know that the contact between human and animals is not something new. People have been um, domesticating animals, have been keeping animals as pets for um, a long time. And even now, even exotic animals have been kept as pets. So with that, people are now being concerned about um, domesticated, uh, domesticated animals contracting the virus. So is that actually a valid concern? And if yes, what should actually people do to reduce um, the risk of that, Dr. Faisal? Yes, uh, thank you, Puan Yati. And uh, again, yes, human play a very critical role uh, in providing multiple opportunity for the virus spillover that we see today uh, by improperly supervising livestock, farming, uh, as well as uh, mixing of wildlife, either this is in an open market or in a, in a particular area uh, that would not come in contact naturally. So in a natural setting, we don't see all this happening. Uh, and this can potentially facilitate it even worse by having uh, illegal wildlife trading, uh, especially for consumption. So, uh, some reports, that just to share quickly, we see that uh, several dogs uh, and cats, uh, especially cats, domestic cats uh, and uh, tigers, of course, uh, they are not pets, but, uh, you know, in some cases, we are, we are listening a lot of different cases in which people keep all these different wildlife as a pet, you know. So, uh, not surprising if we, we hear someone keeping tiger as a pet as well. <laughs> Uh, in which we see uh, these dogs, cats, uh, in contact with infected human have been tested uh, positive for COVID-19. Uh, in addition, uh, ferrets also. So these groups we are talking about, uh, mustelids, like uh, uh, all these mustelid groups, they are also susceptible to the infection. And we see that uh, another quite an important highlight is that in an experimental condition, we're able to see that both of these uh, cats and also ferrets, they were able to transmit infection to other animals of the same species. In fact, uh, about uh, two, three days ago, we hear in the news for the first time, uh, there is a report talking about a spillover that occur in a mink, okay? So mink is being farmed in the uh, Netherlands, so in, in thousands of individuals for their fur. Okay, so we have this uh, infected worker uh, have uh, initially infected these minks. So thousands of them get infected. So they were in the middle of closing down all these uh, farm and also planning to cull them, basically to kill them, to, spot, to, to stop the virus spillover and to to our surprise we record the first case or multiple cases in which there has been a report showing that the virus can move from mink to human so we already have this being reported again we can see that in a more stressful condition probably any sort of uh, transmission can happen so maybe the virologists can uh, explain better on this. But uh, although this happened uh, to only one mink farm in, in Netherlands, uh, this suggests that it is possible to have virus from domestic animal to human. So are we supposed to be concerned what we should be doing? 
yes, we should be concerned and we should take necessary uh, action. Uh, of course, we hear, especially in Malaysia, and I, I'm sure in uh, any part of the world, there are a lot of different SOPs. So I think the same SOPs applies to our, our buddy, our furry buddy, in which, in, way, in which how we manage them. Okay, so uh, the general idea, avoid letting them uh, roaming outside unattended because they may get in contact with uh, people that we don't know uh, who might be carrying any sort of disease, not only uh, SARS-CoV, maybe something else uh, as well. And this is something that we should do despite uh, the disease we are talking about today. So uh, again, uh, however, rest assured, uh, although we hear the case that it is a potential that it moves from a uh, domestic animal to human, but uh, hopefully this is the only isolated case, which is from mink to human. So we don't have any big uh, report on the other potentials yet. So back to you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Faisal. It's interesting to know that uh, it's not the case that um, the virus is transmitted from animals to human. Actually, it's also possible for the virus to be transmitted from human to animals and then back to humans. So the key is to actually manage the management and the SOP. Uh -huh. So it does not apply only for human to human. It should also apply to our furry friends, to uh -huh. animals and especially managing the um, wildlife. Yeah. All right. So one final question from me for um, both of you, Dr. T and Dr. Faisal. Um, since um, by now it is uh, apparent that the emergence of a new virus is actually is a it's a possibility. So what can the community do to prepare for it? So perhaps um, both of you can offer your advice uh, based on your professional background. So maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. T. So Dr. T, as a virologist, what do you think? What can the community do? Okay, so there are two parts of the questions here, the community and also myself as a virologist. So um, if I put on the scientist's hat, I think as a researcher, um, we should continue to do or to conduct um, good quality and high impact research that could help the public to overcome any potential crisis in the future. One example is to improve the uh, virus surveillance in animals, especially in bats, uh, rodents, certain mammals, or even birds. And uh, the information or the knowledge generated from this type of uh, surveillance studies uh, will help to prevent or limit the spillover of viruses to human. Um, for example, um, if you found that exotic viruses are found in wildlife and it has the potential to jump species to humans, then we have the obligation to, to communicate, to inform or to educate the communities about the danger of exposing to such uh, threats. So as we all agree, education and knowledge are always the keys for empowerment. So um, that is the role, I think, uh, a very important role for researchers to play in, in, in coming in the future. In addition, to, uh, I think in the community level, I think researchers together with other community members, we should also play our role in advising the authority, for example, in drawing up regulations or policies uh, against human activities that might facilitate the introduction of a foreign virus into humans. First and, first and foremost, I think the most important is to impose strict prohibition in wildlife trade and consumption. I think we have learned so much from COVID-19 and we are suffering so much from COVID-19 as well. So if there's no human consumption of wildlife uh, animal, wild animals, there will be no COVID-19. And likewise, we could even uh, uh, avoid the HIV pandemic if humans do not consume wild animals because we, we all learned that um, HIV was actually transmitted from chimpanzees to humans about 40 years ago or more than that. So that's very important, strict prohibition in wildlife trade and consumption. And um, in addition to that, I think uh, we must also do our best to protect the environment because the damaged environment would encourage the spillover of this um, um, 
animals or viruses uh, into the human population. Therefore, I think we need a very tight control or regulations that are essential in monitoring human encroachment of the natural environment, mainly through the deforest, uh, deforestation. And yeah, and perhaps we should also come up with some new uh, approaches, innovative approaches for agricultural or farming activities, for example, to improve yield with minimal damage to the environment. So the, the bottom line is protect the environment at all costs. Protect the environment at all costs. Wow, very important message there, I believe. Okay, so Dr. Faisal, as a bad scientist, a mammologist, what is your take on this? How can we as a community prepare for the next virus emergence if it ever happens again? Uh, uh, thank you, Ponyati. I think uh, Dr. T have done a great job. I think he summarized pretty much every aspect. Uh, he, he must be getting this question a lot. Uh, I'll just add on uh, a little bit uh, in which I think it is critical for us to start to manage our wildlife properly and, and also to learn more from them. Uh, so when I say learn more, a lot of research has been pointing towards uh, this, whereby it shows that uh, the answer to this pandemic probably lies within the host itself. So if we are talking about bats, probably by understanding bats, what is their life cycle? You know, how, what is their ecology? And that probably can give us some insight on how are we going to tackle on these viruses. So I think it is quite important um, in which we look into this very seriously. And again, just not to, uh, to boast about bats, uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, we can talk about that besides uh, virus in which people are also looking into anti-aging in bats because bats are very unique they can live up to 40 years old uh, for the very small size they are so again uh, understanding the host is the key for us to to know more and also again to highlight it's very important for us to to manage them well uh, so to, to end uh, this uh, question, I think uh, I'm going to bring all of us back to the phrase that we are commonly using during this uh, pandemic in Malaysia, especially so Malaysia viewers. Uh, so we have this uh, hashtag uh, Kita Jaga Kita. So I think it is about time. So we are moving from PKP, PKPB, PKPP. So it's about time to move the hashtag to Kita Jaga Kita dan Mereka. Oh, so I think, wow. I think it is about time. So uh, that's all from me. Wow, interesting. Dr. Faisal, maybe you can start a new hashtag after this. Kita jaga kita dan mereka. Okay, so to conclude, actually, to be prepared for the next virus emergence, scientists and researchers play a huge role in providing the information to the community. And um, as community, what we can do is um, for us to educate ourselves, to empower ourselves to be more prepared in this and also please abide to the um, regulations set up by the government to avoid um, at all costs the illegal wildlife trade and consumption that only brings us nothing more than negative consequences so far. So. Um, Dr. Faisal and Dr. T, we have um, actually received questions from the viewers and let me read out the questions from the viewers. Yeah, um, we have selected two. So one for um, Dr. Faisal. So Dr. Faisal, this question comes from Muhammad Nazmi Amir Mazlan from YouTube or you, you were um, in YouTube. The question is, um, hi, doctor. In your opinion, does this virus present in all bat species or just a particular species? Also, is there a possibility that the host species varies according to regional factor? I think uh, it's a great question and I'm sure I think uh, the one asking the question must be a zoologist. You know, <laughs> talking about the geographic uh, factors and so forth. Wow, so, okay, let's keep it short then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, just to give an example, uh, the bat that has been uh, on suspect, uh, the horseshoe bat that was thought to carry uh, or potential origin of SARS-CoV-2, uh, 
also can be found in, in Malaysia. And I'm quoting the work that has been done by Per Hilitan, whereby they have a sequence over 22,000. Uh, they have not detected uh, these viruses in uh, the same species that is found in, in Malaysia. So based on that, uh, we can say that, yes, it is highly likely that uh, these viruses uh, are also similar to the genetic variation that we see in bats. There are huge geographic variation in terms of the viruses that we see from one region to the other. Because again, uh, where we live contributes a lot to the different stressor that we receive, uh, in which will contribute towards the different viruses that we have within us. So that's uh, a quick answer to uh, our listener. His okay. name is Nazmi. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mama Nazmi Amir Maslam, for that question. And um, the other question is for Dr. T. So, Dr. T, this question comes from Larson Alessandro um, um, from Facebook Viewer. So, the question is um, if mutation is required, for the virus to infect human, does it mean that actually the exposure of SARS-CoV-2 virus to human happened a long time ago? And um, means just recently they successfully mutated and infected humans. Yeah, thanks for the question. <clears throat> Great question. Um, I think the mutation we are talking about here uh, refers mainly to the adaptive mutation. Um, as we know, the coronaviruses in animals, in bats in particular, they exist in, uh, in, in a huge genetic, uh, huge genetic pool of coronaviruses. Um, so not all of these viruses are able to transmit from one animal to another. And to, in, to, in order to do that, it requires adaptive mutation that probably happen randomly. Know, through natural selection in the environment. And um, once this adaptive mutation uh, has been generated, it slowly adapts to the new host that it is trying to, uh, trying to establish itself. For example, jumping from pangolin, for example, jumping from pangolin to bats and then to humans. I think all these different uh, spillover events requires certain types of uh, adaptive mutations in order for the virus to survive better. Yeah. Okay, so um, unfortunately, although personally, I would love to ask more questions and um, I'm sure the viewers would love to hear more from the both of you. Um, unfortunately, we have um, come to the end of the forum. So on behalf of PetroScience, uh, we would like to thank um, Dr. T and also Dr. Faisal for taking your time to join us in this discussion and share with your expertise, share information on how we can um, prepare for the emergence of new viruses and probably um, uh, avoid and prevent potential outbreaks. So a big thanks also to all of our viewers. We hope that you have enjoyed this informative session and hopefully we can all be more cautious after this and take the necessary measures to protect ourselves, protect our families, protect our communities and to add on as Dr. Faisal said to protect our wildlife and animals as well. So before we wrap, don't forget to follow PetroScience on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also visit our um, website at www.petroscience.com.my for more fun STEM learning and activities. So we hope to see you all again in the next PetroScience STEM Live session. Till then, I'm Noor Hayati Zulkifli. Take care and stay safe. Bye.